recently, I felt like making something visual and fun, and I was really surprised how easy it was to make this super simple roguelike using Rust. This little game has random map generation, enemies that attack, and fog of war, all done in a couple hours. I'll show you the resources I used and my progression. I'll definitely be using this library to explore some other game programming patterns in the future. Hello and welcome to You Code Things. It's been a little while since I last uploaded a video. Anywho, recently while watching the GDC 2019 talks, I somehow found my way to this roguelike subreddit. It's a little awkward because I don't play roguelikes much. Except Binding of Isaac. This subreddit intrigued me greatly as I've recently been coding quite a few gamey things. I've always spent so long working on graphics or just trying to make arty things work. It makes it really hard to throw together some ideas and just see them come to life. Going down the rabbit hole of roguelike talks is simply amazing. Look at all these different art styles of roguelikes. The roguelike subreddit has a roguelike dev subreddit with a nifty list of programming language tutorials. And this is an awesome tutorial. The link is in the description if you want to do it as well. My intention is not to walk you through every line of code. If you want to see the code, it's in the fantastic tutorial instead. I just added this library to the cargo toml file, which is like your package.json for you JavaScript programmers. Then I downloaded this font PNG file thing, and after some typing, it worked. It's kind of crazy. Now we can write a handle key function that uh, mutates some player coordinates, and then just redraws the at symbol in that area. And uh, that's graphics done. This one is uh, kind of interesting because uh, we're just going to keep all our objects, which is everything. It's going to be enemies and items and, and ourselves. They're just going to be in an array that we're just going to iterate through. And the map is a two-dimensional array with tiles. You create a off-screen canvas, which you then uh, blit onto the root canvas. So instead of drawing everything kind of to one, one screen, you kind of have these other screens that you can draw on that have different sizes, and then you can draw them onto that root canvas. I can imagine this would be used for like maybe making a minimap. So maybe you could have like a separate minimap canvas that you draw on and then you put it on that root canvas at the end and kind of layer your UI elements. It's also interesting that everything is just this object struct. At the moment it doesn't have much, but uh, in the future it'll allow attacking and a simple AI. Uh, but for now, it's good to just have three simple methods, move, draw, and clear. Uh, so now we can just loop through and draw everything, loop through and clear. The map is also pretty easy. Uh, it's just we make a new tile struct and then we just define these two kind of important properties. Blocking tile that we can't move through or if it blocks line of sight. This is important later when we want to have field of view and, and we want to like block sight around corners. Put a little solid, solid block there to make sure it was working. There's no use having a map unless we're going to try to procedurally build our dungeon. Which sounds really intimidating, but I was kind of shocked how easy this ended up being. So to do this, we define a rectangle for a room. And so what we're going to do is we're basically going to fill the entire map with solid tiles. And then we're going to place rectangles randomly around the map. And we're going to carve them out. Carve out these like these walkable areas in those rectangles. Then what we do is we put these rooms in a list as we're creating them. What we want to do is with the first room, we want to set the player in the center of the first room. Then for every room after that, we want to draw a corridor. And so even though this sounds like it'll just create kind of like this line of rooms with like a single path through it, what ends up happening is that the rooms are kind of all over the screen and the corridors tunnel through other rooms. And to get from one room to another room, we can either do the vertical corridor first and then the horizontal or the horizontal first and then the vertical. And the answer to this is to flip a coin every time and that gives you a little bit of uh, dynamic corridor action. This is super simple. There's a field of view 
uh, map that comes with the library. In the wiki, there's a bunch of algorithms that can be used. We're using a simple one. All we have to do is put the properties into the field of view map and the field of view map automatically gives us methods that we can use to check if something is within our field of view. And now we just update the rendering method and it works. It's actually that easy. And we can add fog of war very quickly now as well. All we have to do is add an explored field to the tile and set this to true when the tile is within the field of view. Now we only draw the tiles that have been explored and we get this really interesting effect. So monsters are just other objects. They can't do anything yet except be placed on the map. These monsters aren't physical yet and we can walk straight through them. This can be fixed by just adding another property to our object struct. Rust really helps us out by pointing out all the places in the code we have to fix to make the code compile again. We add a name, a blocks and an alive property. So now we can have items that block and don't block. We can have objects that are alive or dead. Everything can have a name. We can now try to write an is blocked function that checks if you can move into a tile. The tutorial is excellent here because there's an ownership issue that crops up, but uh, you can get around it by simply pointing at the array with, a, with an index instead of trying to like split up the array and pass in all the contents into crazy different places. Uh, the first step to having our combat system is a turn system. When the player executes a valid turn, we then have all the objects make a turn. Immediately what we do is we create an enum and we return this, this player turn enum from the handle events. And then straight after we handle the events, we can iterate over our objects and make them have a turn. This works and now we can actually have some fighting happen. So we add a component that might be on the object. We add a fighting component and a AI component and these might be on the object. So we use the option type. This is great because it means we can just check, is it there and then do logic or is it not there? We can't do logic. Rust enforces this, so it's impossible to make a mistake, like completely impossible. When we add the AI component to the things that have AI, now to make an AI turn, we can just iterate over everything that has that AI component on it. The AI is pretty easy. We just calculate a vector of where we're trying to go, and then we move one. The fighter component is extremely similar. We add a take damage method and an attack function. We separate the attack and take damage because you don't want every damage to be from an attack. Maybe there's starvation in your game, maybe there's a trap. But a big ownership problem comes up here. We want to say player attacks monster or monster attacks player, but they're part of the same kind of list. So the list owns them. We can make a function where we split the list between these two different elements, and then we can mutably borrow both of them so we can call them on one another. Now the attacking looks really nice and it passes the borrow checker, which is the most important. This is really cool, but you still can't die. So we're gonna implement a very cool callback. This callback enum is added to the fighter component. It basically instructs, is it a monster or is it a player? If it's a player, we wanna call the player death function, passing in the player object. And if it's a monster, we wanna call the monster death, passing in the monster object. This means that the callbacks can mutate these objects and have them die. The player death function is just some property changes and the monster death function is also some property changes, but importantly for the monster death, we set the fighter and the AI components to none. Now they're just an, an object without any fighting capabilities or any AI. And it works, it's fun, it's surprising. This has been very fun. Uh, even though it's so terrible, like it's been really fun. Thank you, Thomas, for making such an excellent tutorial. So the tutorial has a lot more to check out if you want to continue. There's uh, spells, ranged combat, items, there's main, a main menu, there's saving, there's uh, creating like more levels of dungeons, monster and item progression, and even adventuring gear. Again, thanks Thomas for making such an excellent tutorial. Link is below. See you next time, and thank you for watching, your legend.